All right, everybody, welcome back. Totally Driven Radio, and here we are. The moment I've been waiting for. I've probably been waiting for a moment like this for uh, close to 30 years now. And, Frank, I'm pretty stoked and pretty excited. Oh, you and me both. Like I said, I don't get a chance to talk uh, good music with anybody nowadays because just, <laughs> you know, I work with kids and, you know, they they, they don't they wouldn't know good music if it came up and uh, kicked them in the uh, family jewels. <laughs> well, let's get the man of the hour on the line. Ron Sobel, you are live on the air. Welcome to Totally Driven Radio, Ron. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Can you hear me okay? I hear you for perfectly fine. So we're talking Eagles football and Silver Linings playbook tonight, right? <laughs> there you go. How, how about uh, you actually have a tie to Philadelphia? You texted me earlier. So are you an Eagles fan? You know, I'd rather see him win than lose. <laughs> <laughs> but Andy Reid looked pretty pathetic that last game. He just looked really sad. It, it, it was a sad state of affairs the whole season, and it just got sadder and sadder each week. It was just bad. We yeah. were in pain. We were in pain. But, uh, hey, you know, I guess the pain is over for now until next season starts. Yeah. Well, Ron, uh, oh, my God. Uh, first of all, let me say thank you because not only thank you for contacting me on Facebook this past week, but thank you for all the documentation you did through that whole time of, um, you know, from being with Kevin and then Kevin and Randy and the whole Quiet Riot thing. I mean, if it wasn't for you, we'd be screwed. <laughs> well, that's the pack rat in me saving all my stuff. And uh, a lot of it I had totally forgotten about. Like a lot of magazines would ask for Randy pictures. And, and I gave them the ones I thought that would be best for a magazine. And if you look at the book, there's like a lot, you know, hundreds of photographs that wouldn't be good in a rock magazine, but if they're in a book, then it really tells a story and it's something special that, you know, no one's ever seen. Yeah, you know, it's funny, like through the years, um, a little background about myself real quick, like I can tell you like when when I found out Randy uh, passed in the accident, I was literally, I mean, I was 12 years old. I was at the barber's around the corner from my house. I'm in the barber chair, and a friend of mine from the neighborhood who was also an Aussie Randy fan, he was walking by the window of the barber shop, and there I am, the little chubby kid getting my hair cut. And he saw me there, and he's like, oh, my God. And he ran in. He's like, dude, Randy Rhodes was killed in a plane crash. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And it was, you know, he heard it on the radio. So, like, that is how – of course, the fascination more after he had passed grew with Randy, and he would start seeing all the pictures in the magazine. And as the years went on, it was like more and more of these pictures were like slowly leaked out through the years. And I would always say to myself, there has to be like all this, you know, footage and pictures and all this stuff. And lo and behold, you were the keeper of everything. <laughs> I have. Yeah, I, I shot Super 8 movies of Quiet Riot, and um, they're in the movie. I never imagined that they'd be used for something like this. In fact, what happened was, you know, I got approached to do the book, so we did the book, and I said, you know, I've got these movies. I'd really like them to be, like, a, a little bonus feature of the book, like a 20-minute um, compilation of, you know, not every single frame of the, of the footage because there's like about 40 minutes worth, but if we put some of the best stuff on a little bonus disc, that'd be nice to, to add to the book and make it special. Well, we decided that once they shot an interview with me that we'd start interviewing more people that were involved with Quiet Riot, the fan club president, Lori Holland, Randy's fiance Jody, BGA, and uh, Rudy Sarzo, Drew Forsyth, the drummer, Brian Reeves and the Guitar Tech, and um, it became this 90-minute movie that, you know, I, I never expected that to happen. It, it, so I mean, if somebody's listening and doesn't get it, the book comes with a movie, and instead of now, the movie was supposed to be the bonus to the book, it's kind of like the book is a bonus to the movie. It's an incredible you package. You watched the movie, right? <laughs> Of course, I watched it Christmas Day. That's when I put my I put the thing on there on Facebook, and I said I watched it, and we all obviously know how the story ends. 
And still, when it comes to the end with Randy being killed and the crash and the footage and all, I mean, I was sitting there in tears. And I put that on Facebook on your um, your company page for Red Match Productions that released everything. And next thing I know, I got a, a, a message from you. And we had started going back and forth. And I went back again yesterday and watched it again so I could just refresh, make sure everything was fresh in my mind for tonight. And again, at the end, it brought me to tears. I, I mean, to show you how much Randy meant to me, Ron, here, now this is – Straight up fact, my father died when I was four years old. So I grew up, it was me and my mom and my grandparents with us. My bedroom walls were completely covered with Randy Rhodes. My mom would get so mad at me. Like when I would come home with magazines and Randy posters and stuff, she would say to me constantly, why do you worship that dead guy? Your father is dead. Why don't you worship him? You worship this other dead guy. She used to get so angry at me. And and I used to like, you know, look at the pictures at Randy. I would go and make her like bring me to stores and buy clothes like him so I can dress like him. I had like the white shoes and I would try to wear the pants like him and the vest and all that stuff. And it used to drive mm-hmm. my mother nuts. She could not stand it. And but I mean that was my whole thing. I, I was just so obsessed with Randy Rhodes, and I was like the big Randy Rhodes supporter in school. You know. Waving the Randy Rhodes, keeping the spirit alive, and I would always hear the interviews with like Ozzy and Kevin, and you know how they always wanted to keep Randy's memory alive, and you know being a big fan, that's what I felt like I wanted to do as well. Did you take guitar lessons? I took guitar lessons. I played guitar for many years. I was horrible because as I as I'm 42 years old now, I come to realize I was more worried about trying to look like Randy Rhodes instead of play like Randy Rhodes. <laughs> So right. that's and a problem I, for a lot of musicians. And I realize it now, and unfortunately, I failed at both. But I kind of followed more in your, I guess, your brother's footsteps, where I ended up playing in a local punk band in this area for 16 years, and we had a lot of fun. So the bottom line, I got to have fun with it. That was it. <laughs> mm-hmm. For anybody but, out there that doesn't know what he's talking about, my brother's in a band called the Dickies. They're a punk band that's been around over 30 years. And my brother's also interviewed in the movie. He is the fact that my brother introduced me to Kevin Dubrow. Yeah, now that was that was the whole. Um, now you, he introduced you guys, and you guys hit it off by being like photographers and um, sharing pictures. We were pictures. both photographers, and I and we were both huge Humble Pie fans. So what happened was, I, I my brother said you should meet this guy Kevin. I go okay. I met him. And we made it like, I don't know, I guess you might call it an appointment. I mean, I went over to his house to see all his photographs and collect the, and collectible stuff he had, and I was blown away by it because I thought I had some, like, cool stuff, but Kevin just had so much stuff. He, what he used to do was he would be a pen pal with people, like, in England and Europe. You could place an ad in a magazine for, like, 5 or $10, and... People would write you, and they they would want stuff from America, and Kevin and then I would want stuff from England, and and you would send stuff back and forth. It was it was a kind of a neat little hobby to have. Yeah, that's see you know, that's um you know before social media and internet and all that stuff. That's how everything was done, and people connected. And that's we it, actually it, were writing letters. <laughs> how about that? Handwritten, yeah. not even typed. Handwritten letters. Yes. <laughs> So now, how long were you guys uh, friends for before Randy and Kelly came into the picture? I met Kevin in uh, September of I don't know. Let's see. I graduated high school in uh, June '72, so I met him in September '72. Okay. And so we met. He met Randy March 1975, and then I met him a week later. Wow. So Kevin and I were pretty tight by the time. He met Randy. Okay, so it was about two and a half years. And um, so then it was just the three of them. And, and again, you were there through this whole process. And as I'm looking at everything, I say to myself, it's just, it's kind of eerie, too, that you were just able to get so much documentation, so much pictures. Uh, It's weird. Like, you don't think, like, today, like, people hanging out or bands, even with the whole Facebook thing, they're taking as much as you did. And that was, you know, 40 years in the 70s, early, mid-70s. It's just crazy how much you were really taking. (laughs) 
Oh, I, you know, it was just the thing I did. It was like a natural thing to take these pictures of that band. They were very photogenic, so it made it easy and it made it fun. And and I'm glad I did it. I, I had th- those ten years from like 19. I also went on to work for the Metal Health version of Choir Riot. Those ten okay. years from like 1975 to 1985 were the best ten years of my life. I mean, I got to tour with Metal Health version of Choir Riot around the world, and let me tell you, everything you've heard about what happens on a rock tour from back then happened. It was the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> we were uh, in Philadelphia a few times. Yeah, you know what, you guys. As a matter of fact, '83, I guess it was Quiet Riot tour. I think they played the Tower Theater, which is yeah, where I was I, there. I grew up uh, two blocks from the Tower Theater, and actually, Randy played there with Ozzy in '81, I think it was. And I was uh-huh. too young at the time to go, but I have, which I'm going, I have to find this picture. I have a picture. A friend of mine, his cousin was at that show, and he took a picture, a photo of Randy. And, Ron, this picture is beautiful. And I traded, like, I had caught, like, Nikki Six picks at a Motley Crue concert in the 80s, mm-hmm. and I traded right. these picks for this picture. And I never shared this picture with anybody, because I didn't want anybody to take it and try to sell it or anything. And I have it, and I, I'll um I'll scan it and send it over to you so you can check it out. It's cool. just an awesome yeah, like picture. Yeah, like Yeah. Uh-huh. But, um, the, the people the, the people that helped me with the book are huge Randy fans, more of the Randy Rhodes and Ozzy era than the Quiet Ride era. But uh, so they know a lot more about like the details of like what he would wear at every show and order of songs. Whereas uh, I had seen him playing Quiet Ride, I probably saw him do 160 shows. Wow. And uh, and countless rehearsals. So I you know. He was a fully formed rock star by the time he got to Ozzy. 